Richard Louis is a veteran and award-winning journalist with more than 30 years in television, film, technology, and business, uh, currently at MSNBC, uh, previously with CNN. He's the first Asian American man to anchor a daily national cable news program and a Team Emmy and Peabody winner. He has just completed an Oscars qualifying documentary on student caregivers and military families that will hit national broadcast and mainstream streaming in late 2021. Uh, in addition, Richard's 15 year business career involves a FinTech patent and launching six tech brands over three business cycles. He has lived, worked and volunteered in every continent. He is also a caregiver. Um, and that is what brings us together today. Tell us yeah. about what has brought you to to caregiving. Well, the caregiving is really sort of dominated my thinking, um, my personal and professional life, and uh, for the last probably seven to eight years. And on the way in, you know, I had no idea, and it just kept on growing in its. Um, and I mean this in a really good way in its teaching, uh, in its influence, um, in its. Um, all sort of embracing think um culture of what i am and what i might i support mm -hmm. so and it was my dad was diagnosed with alzheimer's um and i made a decision that i would try to be in california to help care for him and i work in new york at 30 rocks so i was certainly stuck and uh, when i approached my boss and and she you know i i kind of thought you know as a journalist uh a news anchor we we work just every day. I and mean, there's no such thing as, you know, can you work a set number of days off? So when I walked in, I thought she's gonna say, well, you know, I, I like you, Richard, good guy, da da da. We don't really have a position for you. Right. And instead, she she said, I'm a long distance caregiver too. my mom's in Florida. And then she said, what I didn't expect her to say is let's figure out three or four solutions options for you. And yeah. so now, uh, six, seven years later, I've been working Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I was there flying out three times a week, and one week I'd stay here. And you know, I, you're used to flying. I'm used to flying, but not. This was just too much. I mean, it was like right. three hundred thousand a year, oh and God. I just kept on going and going. And I'm standing. We're talking in the winter right now. I would stand in that subway station, thinking, "All right, it's three thirty in the morning." Why am I here by myself looking down, you know, that long, cold tube and you're wondering, is there a train coming? And mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of time to think about why you're doing it. And um, so what I'm just trying to say is I, I knew I wanted to do it, but I kept on going, wow, this is this is a, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Just that image of like standing alone in a train station, hoping a train comes along, feeling alone and sad feels like whether you're actually in that moment but also an image that I feel like a lot of caregivers could relate to, um, yes, you know, exactly. Speaking. Yeah. Um, and that's really powerful. And so during that time, obviously it exhausted you. Um, but you know, but you, you did it. Um, and you, you know, you, it was part of who you were and it made a huge impact. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, if you could talk a bit more about that time with your dad and what yep. it meant for you to to be a caregiver, to be there for him. Um, you know, it is, I feel like people generally think of women as caretakers, right? Um, and, you know, you being a, a working journalist, professional stepping into this role is not what we typically envision as the caregiver. Yeah. So I'm curious, you know, what was your, what did that feel like for you to be in that role? And, and, you know, and knowing that you were sort of, you know, not what everyone had in mind when they thought of that. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what was supposed to, what was a stereotype or, you know, what people might think. And in, in my mom's family, it was her that was always expected to take care of her siblings. She was the youngest daughter. She grew up in a different time that, you know, really was kind of like the exponential factor for that right. very dynamic of women having to be the caregiver and take care of everybody. Sure. Um, and then I, I found out as I was starting to do more uh, and as, you know, you start engaging, uh, uh, you know, you, you start to learn more. And one thing I learned is that four out of 10 family caregivers are male. And the, the issue is that we just don't talk about it. Right. Yeah. And our culture sort of propagates this idea that if you're a family caregiver, you're female. Um, it's sort of unsaid, but said. And so that was partially also why I was super open to talking about it, 
because we need more folks saying that of all different flavors and backgrounds and whatever you want to call it, because this is a game that we're all in and we're in it to win it the best that we can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my dad, you know, was my mom's caregiver. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think for him, especially early on when he would try to go to support groups and find people, he definitely felt uh, like he wasn't, it wasn't that he was alone. You know what I mean? There were other right. people very much in his situation. And so, but I think that again, it goes to sharing our stories that can end stigma, um, which certainly you have done. Um, in your book, um, you've, you know, you tackled some very difficult questions about the Asian American experience. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to Alzheimer's, they've experienced discrimination seeking Alzheimer's care. Um, I'm just curious, you know, your personal professional journey, what <laughs> you've learned about discrimination uh, in healthcare, how do we combat it? Um, you know, what has your experience been? Yeah, it's kind of like a push pull, um, uh, you know, from from the different backgrounds, whether it be, uh, you know, Latino, black, native, Asian, white, um, all the different backgrounds have a different experience. I talk about such issues very differently. And, you know, in my family, being of Asian uh, background, I'm Asian American and Pacific Islander, it was uh, not something that I think was necessarily cultural, I think it was more people don't like to talk about it. Now, the way we don't talk about it is maybe a little bit different by culture, but we all don't talk about it. And when we all do talk about it, uh, we also express it in different ways. The often used uh, example in Asian American Pacific Islander spaces is the way that parents say, I love you, is, have you eaten, right? And so that's just different the way <laughs> they say it. Uh, yeah. And so when I, was, when I think about the push pull part now on the other side okay so that's the really the supply side on on the other side of you know getting help and getting the right assistance um we we don't for instance have a good number of facilities that address the cultural differences i was just curious you know yeah. saying, my dad's fairly you know uh bicultural tricultural whatever you want to say so he never had an issue going to and i'll just use this term because i don't know if there's a term mainstream care sure. you know uh, care groups or, or or care homes like when he would go out and meet his friends we didn't go to just ones for aapis he just went went down to the institute of aging it's for everybody um but i do know there's a certain group that would feel more comfortable uh if we had care homes and care groups that were focused on certain uh specialties and, yeah. and i think that that's a real opportunity to making the discussion of long-term care more mainstream and, and therefore also more specialized at the same time. We can make it more accessible. Yeah. So I think there's an opportunity to do that. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I hope we're at the forefront of ch the, a change in care in this country and, and hopefully Build Back Better will, will pass and will somehow create some sort of good infrastructure for caring for people at home, but also for creating, you know, like you said, places where, you know, people with dementia can feel safe, but not trapped and they can thrive while not being, uh, you know, locked in, in a way, which often happens in, in places that are caring for people because they're not qualified. They're not yes. specialized, whether it's dementia or a specific background. Right. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, hopefully we can, but again, that's why it's important to share stories. Yes. And to talk about the need. And, and, and to be vulnerable about, about it. I mean, I think the, the, the thing that I've learned most recently is talking about mental health and caregiving and to, to openly say uh, in conversations like the ones you and I are having right now is, you know, I don't know about my mental health. I worry about my physical health. So why would I worry about my mental health? Right. Given how much time and effort and emotion that you know uh i've given to care for my dad uh, and now my mom and you know, you know it's it's okay not to know but to explore and, and work at it mm -hmm. and, and because of uh living through two very difficult years with a with a pandemic i think we are talking about it in o yeah. more open and more vulnerable ways which is important because mental health does not equal an angry person as you know screaming at the sky walking down the street it it oh, could be that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard about that. And no, we do. There are days we do that, but we don't do it all the time. Right. Um, right. There are days that we are 
sad uncontrollably. And there are days that we are laughing mm -hmm. uncontrollably because we found something new in our loved one and what they're doing. I have learned to laugh yeah. in ways that I've never laughed before because yeah. of seeing something that was quite beautiful in my father and, right. and, and in the family and what we're doing to caregive. So when you were in the midst of caregiving, you know, we're talking about mental health, depression, it is a heavy load to carry. Um, tell me about how, you know, how did you get through those heavier moments? I, I read a thing about how you wrote a letter of gratitude to your dad. Um, how did you find, uh, you know, at, at HFC, we often talk about bringing light to the darkness. How did you find light in your dark moments? Yeah, it's, I'm so glad you said that. Because, you know, I, I say joy despite difficulty. I mean, very similar ideas. And um, and it, it's because, I, as I was saying earlier, you know, I'm, I'm laughing in, in new ways. I'm also crying in new ways. Uh, I think I'm more emotionally aware. Um, I'm also more emotionally vulnerable. And these are all good things. I mean, to say that often means weakness. And the one thing I've learned is I can say that, and I actually mean strength. I actually mean that it is uh, a muscle I wouldn't have had had I not gone through this journey with my father for the last eight years. Yes. And right. And and at it, it, that maturity, like the gift, he, look, he, if I had any choice, I'd probably prefer him not to have had Alzheimer's. But what a gift it was to now have this strength uh, that I know has already served me in, in, in many different ways. I, I wouldn't have not have uh, done a movie about young caregivers and military families. There's no way I would have written a book about selflessness. None of these things would have happened if it weren't for the caregiving journey, because it really does, you know, crack your head open. And, and you know this so well. I mean, HFC, like if you, right? No, would have never. I say it no. all the time. Like, I would I rather have my mom? Yeah. Have I also added in on top of the pain so many incredible relationships with new people I would have never known and a feeling of purpose and yes. you know, making something out of my loss. So yes. Exactly. Yes. You you and I and many others uh, of the millions that have, are living through it, we're, we're taking that energy and our loved ones and we are making it something, it doesn't always have to be greater, but we, our effort is to, to make it better um and and i feel very honored that uh it's all happened so the way i get through it is to keep it in my works to make it part i know that's what he would want me to do you know i think about well what I, should i write the book about this like typical journals write a book about what they report on i, I did not want to do that i didn't think it was additive enough for for what i knew well and what i was learning and and, and cared about most was the caregiving of my father uh, and now my mother and so when, when I think of the, the different ways that we express uh, what we've learned and try to make a difference, it, whatever works, works. And I like it all. I like it all. And talking about it, becoming um, a, a, a volunteer and a caregiving ambassador for two or three organizations, that's been part of my therapy. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at the time. Yeah. I'm betting you with HFC, it's part of your therapy too. 100%. Yep. Yep. We're talking about it. We have to think really carefully about, okay, wait, Lauren just asked me, how am I? And I really stopped to think, how am I? And the way I think I've coped's not the way, the way I've lived through it is that if somebody asks me how I'm doing or my father's doing, I'm really listening to that person if they really want to know. <laughs> and if they really want to know, Lauren, right. I, I will 80% of the time, I, I assume they do. And I give them the details. Yeah. Because I think it's, again, that importance of showing that openness so that somebody else uh, maybe can take something away from it. Absolutely. I, I, I thought I hear you so, so loud and clear on, you know, my mom was, we went through her journey was for 15 years. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the last seven or so she was completely nonverbal and immobile and unable to care for herself really in any way. And that was obviously a really difficult thing to live through uh, for, you know, myself and of course my, my family. Um, but I could tell when the answer was like, how's your mom? And I'd be like, not great. And they're like, but she still has good days. Right. And I'd be like, yeah. So anyway, or 
because yeah. <laughs> they don't really want to know or the response of like, how's your mom? Pretty shitty. Oh God, I'm so sorry. What is it? How can I help? What's happening? You know, and, and really wanting to know. And, and I, I get it. It's such an uncomfortable thing, but sharing the reality is, is, is helpful. It is. Uh, and, and, and did you find yourself also asking that question differently to other folks after that? Oh, definitely. Well, I, you know, I often like, don't want to even ask. I yeah. just like, I know it's shitty. Sorry. Cause it's just like, no matter how you slice it and all cases of, of Alzheimer's and dementia are different. You know what I mean? I don't assume that people are living in all the same situations, but they're all hard. And that I know. I actually, I want to pivot and talk about your, your documentary about young caregivers. I mean, obviously I know the inspiration, but tell me about it. You know, that was, so it's called Sky Blossom and what's happening in the future for it at the moment is it'll be on PBS in uh, May, I think May of 2022. You know, when I started it five and a half years ago, I did it because I knew that we had a gap in understanding what family caregiving is. I didn't even know what it meant in the beginning. Yeah. And there's a lot of caregivers today. And I say, so what's like to be a caregiver? Uh, I don't even know what you're talking about, Richard. All I know is I love my wife, love my husband, love my mom, my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, my grandmother. That word is just super strange. And so I knew that we had a cultural gap. Mm -hmm. And so how do we we close it? Um, and the, the most powerful, one of the most powerful tools out there is film, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so then began the journey of selecting what would the what section of the 53 million would the movie be about? Because we couldn't do it on all of them because it touches, as you know, all ages, all backgrounds, all states, you pick it. Mm -hmm. And so we, we looked at uh, young caregivers, students especially. So the, the, there are five characters, uh, five subjects. They're aged 11 to 26. They're in the Midwest, the South, the East, the West, and the Pacific Islands. They are Latino, they're Black, they're Native, Asian, and White. And the purpose of it was to show that there's some really awesome young people out there that are caregivers. There are 5 million of them that are younger than 18, 5 million. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know they're there. But what I did know is that they are, especially in these military families, the next greatest generation. And you know what, when it came down to it, we were all caregivers together yeah. And you know, there's that, that when you first bring it up with somebody, we we're saying this earlier, how all of a sudden you're just a, a family yeah. and she felt it. And so did Camille and so did Rihanna. Uh, all of them felt it. And they gave so much in these interviews over the, you know, the, the years that we were interviewing them. And they were telling us things that were um, really special. And, you know, they would cry and they would laugh. And we let a lot of the stuff sit on the cutting room floor because this wasn't about how can we get them to cry? Because when I was talking with them, it was just, you know, what's it like to care for your dad? Yeah. Um, what does it mean to care for grandpa? Mm -hmm. And they really stopped and thought and then gave their heart. And the, the one thing you know, as a journalist uh, who's covered a lot of human trafficking, um, I know that I get to walk away mm -hmm. and they have to live. Yeah. And I told all the families, you're giving me a gift. I know it's a gift because I'm a caregiver like you and I'm going to guard it. You don't worry. I'm going to take it to its very ending. I'm not going to throw it over to somebody else. I'm going to be in the editing room. I'm going to be there for all, all of the screenings. I'm going to be there when we, we put it on air. Don't worry. And we have been able to do that, which I'm glad. But they they were they wowed me. Uh, and I've interviewed lots of folks. Uh, but they, as you can tell, I'm a little bit of a fan of, of all of them. And I, I do believe that it will inspire and, and fortify mm -hmm. the strength of caregiving, will fortify the strength and future yeah. of these young military caregivers. And we need to do that because I'm super hopeful about them and leading this country. It's so important to tell these stories. And, you know, it's just 
to humanize. And it doesn't surprise me at all that when you sat down to talk to these people, they had a lot to say because they've been living such a life of so feelings and emotions. And, and I find that, you know, most caregivers, again, if you ask the right questions, have quite a story to tell. So they do, they yeah. do. And they yeah. give their, their heart to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's wrap it up uh, on a positive note, which you sort of touched on, which is, you know, this next great generation, like, what do you see as, as challenges, but also opportunities that caregivers, uh, you know, have in, in this space? Where do you see things going? There wasn't a lot to look forward to, especially for folks that were living with Alzheimer's and, you know, such to a degree that we wouldn't even the word diagnose. Why do we even need to diagnose it? Because there's nothing we can right. do with it anyway. So why should we bother to invest in, in diagnoses? And so I think the last year, um, you know, with uh, talking with the community, you, you know, the, the latest developments in, in for instance, pharma, uh, wasn't you know uh the silver bullet but it gave hope and we have had no hope for two decades zero yeah. uh, billions and billions of dollars you know and and no hope and now we have a, a you know an inkling of hope which has now energized the diagnosis side of the business if you will of the community new ways of finding out whether or not earlier on whether we might have that probability of getting and living with alzheimer's yeah. So I think we are now living through an exciting time. And, you know, in the Alzheimer's Association, they have the white flower, which is, you know, the day without Alzheimer's. And, you know, I think at least we're closer to that mm -hmm. than we were five years ago, where it felt like I, I can't even see the end yeah. of this tunnel. And so, Lauren, when you ask me what's ahead, I think in terms of if I get diagnosed with Alzheimer's, first of all, I'm diagnosed. Two is there might be a treatment that slows it or better, right? And that is that's a huge, huge um, development. I'm so glad. And I also think that um, the sort of content and programming and awareness that we have been bringing to the very uh, topic is only seems to be growing year over year over year. Uh, I'm very interested in what you think, but I, I just feel like we're talking about it more caregiving. Yeah and Alzheimer's. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, from when I started talking about this and learning about it to today is, I feel like a completely different game. You can go back to my mom's diagnosis, we'll call it, because even back then it was harder to get, you know, 15, yep, yep. 17 years ago it was. Um, but, um, you know, I have so much hope where I didn't have any before. Yeah. I think that, you know, we focus a lot on teaching young people about how to care for their brains um, so that yeah. maybe they can delay the onset of dementia so that science can catch up and have a cure. And that's, you know, I think just having that hope and that promise of, you know, there's scientific evidence that you can actually keep your brain healthy is pretty exciting. And also just the conversations we're having around care you know, the fact that a documentary like yours, that stories like yours are being shared and listened to, I think are the path forward because Alzheimer's is a disease that has lived in darkness. And if we keep it there, it'll stay there. But if we, you know, share our truth and share our reality, hopefully, hopefully we can make a change. I'm so with you. And, and, and we're now in that space where it is let's get mad at the disease and not the person yeah and before it was we because we didn't know what it was it was like oh well mom i'm so why is she do i'm so angry for doing that mm -hmm. well it's not mom it is the disease and yeah. we have to really focus our anger and our 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 can-do attitudes at that disease yeah and, and and now that it's more out in the light so we can we can deal with it I'm, I'm very glad and, and your five tips and your five areas that you you try to get out to the world so that we can stay and stave off the possibility of, of Alzheimer's and or dementia is so important because uh, like you said, we didn't and we still don't necessarily have that have that big thing that'll destroy the disease. Yeah. 
Well, until then, we have our stories. Uh, and I so appreciate you sharing yours with me and with our audience. And um, I'm just excited that we got to have this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for doing this. Don't stop. Okay, so we're gonna uh, end on something silly. Do you have your, do you have tape? Tape? I can get tape. Uh, and what do you do with tape at the end? You put it on your well, face? If we if we get it wrong, we have to put a piece of tape on our face. Oh my god, that's perfect. Yeah. So, except look look at the tape though. This is all I got. What do you got? Let me see your tape. Mine is much much cuter. It's just gift wrap tape. So you're gonna be in much more trouble. Although, although maybe you'll be great at this. I don't think I'm going to be. So basically we've stolen this game from the tonight show. Uh, and it's, you know, a brain game, but basically I think we're going to go back and forth just saying any word that comes to mind. And if there's any type of, you know, step stutter, then we'll, you put a piece of tape on your face and, and uh, wow. And three and three pieces of tape. You're, you're done. You lose what if game. we, what if we repeat? Yeah. If you repeat, you get a piece of tape. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna okay. All right. And uh, and how long can I delay and think? I think it's like if it's more than like a second. A second. Okay. Okay. Ready? Desk. Table. Chair. Tape. Sign. Wheel. Pencil. Pen. Leaf. Tree. Driveway. Car. Flower. Ugh. I think that was it. I think you got to put a piece of tape on. <laughs> that was such an easy one. <laughs> you see it? It's here. All right, you did it. You did it. All right, you start next. Okay, country. A state. Pop. Flag. Paper. Pen. Mike. Stand. People. Joint. Woman. Plate. What, say it again? Plate. <laughs> oh, spoon. Shoe. Shoestring. Oh! <laughs> I, I thought you said you're not very good at this, but clearly. I didn't think I was, but oh, I think you got to take it and like maybe tape it up here, but you know, whatever. This is our rules. You don't have to make yourself you know, up here like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, let's do it one more round. One more round. Are you all ready? Right. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, curtain. Call. Dress. Pants. Jeans. Shoes. Feet. Socks. Toothbrush. Teeth. Sink. Water. Shower. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I lost. <laughs> All right. I think we did it here. I'm going to just in solidarity. Thank you. Look, I'm going to, I'll take my nose. Like, Thank you. We'll end it. We'll end this like this. This was fun. Thank, Thank you, you for playing this silly game, uh, which challenged our brains. It challenged um, mine more than yours, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and again, <laughs> thank you for your amazing work and and all you do. Um, you're you're so amazing, and you're such a, a great example of a of a caregiver who just gives gives their all. So I appreciate you putting it out there for people to see. Oh, uh, thank you, Lauren. This is uh, my first time uh, doing this with you, and I don't know if it's gonna, there's going to be a second, but <laughs> thank you for doing it. <laughs> You'll never do this again. Look, you know what, HFC. H is for hilarity. I don't know I what love this it. is, but anyway. I love it. Um, all right. Thanks again. All right. See ya.